Welcome to the Archaeology Studio. Today's episode considers tracks, trails, paths, and roads. How can we identify these traces in historical records, in archaeological sites, or in the landscapes around us today? What can we learn from these overland travel routes toward understanding the cultural contexts of landscapes? All of these diverse forms of travel routes share a single primary purpose of facilitating transportation from one point to another. Additionally, these routes greatly shape how people experience these surrounding landscapes. I should acknowledge that people use different definitions about these categories of overland transportation routes. Generally, tracks refer to small and informal traces of where a person or an animal has moved over the ground. Roads refer to more formalized routes that can accommodate a heavy load of traffic. Between those two ends of a spectrum, you could propose various definitions of trails, paths, or other categories. In this video, I would like to encourage new thoughts and ideas about overland transportation routes as parts of landscapes. I will guide through a few perspectives, frameworks, and examples that you could modify and expand for your own interests. In the modern world, Roads are essential for the functioning of societies and economics. Whenever or wherever roads have been constructed, then the transportation routes have developed with housing, businesses, utility services, and more. By comparison, the places without roads or without updated road technology have been underdeveloped. In any case, transportation routes shape how we experience the world around us. Tracks, trails, paths, and roads can signify much more than the practical transport between point A and point B. These aspects of roads have been known throughout human history and extending back into the distant past of the archaeological record. Just as one example here, Ancient Rome was famous for building roads, mostly during the period between 300 BC and AD 300, hence the colloquial saying about how all roads lead to Rome. Of course, numerous tracks, trails, paths, and roads already had existed for a long time, but the Roman Empire invested greatly in road building efforts at a large scale. The Roman road system facilitated the movements of armies, as well as the long-distance commerce and trade that enabled the cross-regional economies of the time. Many of these roads supported additional developments, such as the aqueducts that carried water into the major cities. Additionally, the roads allowed the people in the outside farmlands and rural areas to become more involved with the activities in the cities and with the larger cross-regional commerce. Furthermore, roads often connected with seaports and therefore with overseas trades and relations. Road building technology has changed considerably through time involving the raw materials of the construction, the nature of the traffic moving along those roads, and the tools and machinery for the building and for the long-term maintenance. In many cases, ancient routes were modified or upgraded with newer technologies. Several modern roads follow the same or similar routes that in total had existed for several hundreds if not thousands of years. Historical maps can reveal considerable information about transportation routes. I can illustrate with one example here using just three maps from Guam in the years 1914, 1944, and 1954. Within those few decades, the road system changed significantly. In 1914, the major roads connected the larger villages and military bases, especially at the naval port. Several smaller roads were unimproved or unpaved, 
used mostly for foot traffic or for carts pulled by water buffalo. Much of the northern portion of Guam included no roads or very little road access. This situation changed substantially by 1944, and then continued to develop by 1954 into nearly the same road system that exists today. You could apply this same approach with historical maps in other areas, keeping in mind about the historical context of each map. You might consider the roles of trains, automobiles, bridges, tunnels, seaports, and airports during different time periods. I should note that modern satellite imagery and remote sensing datasets are extremely effective in revealing the traces of formal roads. Even when these roads have been covered by thick vegetation growth, they still are easy to detect. The raw materials and the density of surface packing make formal roads appear in strong and steady visual signals with clear contrast against their surroundings. This kind of clear signal is lacking, though, in the cases of informal tracks and trails, unless the remote sensing datasets are collected through an exceptionally high resolution, usually at a close range or low altitude. Depending on the forms of tracks, trails, paths, and roads in a given study area, the possibilities can be adjusted for using remote sensing survey and mapping. In any case, though, Traditional on-the-ground survey and test excavations always can reveal useful information. During a project in American Samoa, I documented a stone-lined pathway, or road, as part of an older traditional village complex, dated about a few centuries old. The largest effort here was for clearing the vegetation enough to expose the details of the stonework construction. As might be expected, the foundations and footprints of the old houses were built nearby the old travel route. In a modern context, roads tend to be convenient for measuring property boundaries, for installing utility service lines, and for other purposes. Diverse physical constructions could exist with or around roads or other travel routes. Many of these constructions developed through long periods of time. Moreover, people have developed different traditions about using these travel routes and experiencing all of these surrounding interrelated components. Modern travel routes provide plenty of opportunities to explore how tracks, trails, paths, and roads came to exist and how they developed in relation with their surrounding landscapes. These observations can help toward understanding the core principles about transportation roads that always have existed throughout human cultural history, although they have been manifest in variable expressions and outputs. If you can explore in an area without modern paved roads, then you can learn even more about the variable forms of overland transportation routes. Whenever I encounter an unpaved dirt road, then I look for signs of how the road was created and used. Signs of modern automobile traffic are easy to identify. The wheels of the vehicles repeatedly created grooves into the ground in two even parallel lines, while the innermost area has remained less affected. If the road had been used only by foot traffic or by animal-drawn carts or wagons, then the innermost area would have been worn and eroded downward. Whenever I see a mostly unaffected innermost area, then I know that the road was used by modern automobile vehicles. The downward eroded portions tend to collect water and to remain soggy or damp for some time. The less affected areas tend to support some vegetation growth and root systems, and their slightly higher ground level can allow drainage of rainwater more easily than in the adjacent eroded portions. In terms of how a road was created, most roads today have been cleared by modern machinery, such as a bulldozer. The cuts from the machine blades sometimes can be observed in spots of rocky ground. 
Most often, the blade cuts from the bulldozer or other heavy machinery are visible along the edge profile of a road. At first, these blade cuts can be clean and nearly at right angles, but soon enough they will start to erode or slump into a sloped edge. After some time, vegetation may begin to overgrow these sloped edges. In many cases, only one side of a machine-cleared road will show a blade cut edge, while the corresponding opposite side will show push piles or areas of pushed debris. The debris piles could include entire trees that have been uprooted from the roadway. This pattern is easiest to identify within the first few days or weeks after the event of a mechanical road clearing. Later, the physical indications tend to become eroded and overgrown, and they still can be detected. You would need to learn how to see through the surface erosion and vegetation growth. Older roads without the use of bulldozers typically were cleared by manual labor. Sometimes plows may have been used. In any case, the blade cut edges of a bulldozed road would be absent. Instead, the clearing debris piles would have been redistributed along both sides of the roadway. The resulting lines of moved earth and rubble often created formalized edges of these older roadways. Some of the rocky rubble potentially could be used for filling or paving the road surface. In most cases, though, the rubble was convenient for building stonework borders, especially along property lines. In some places, people have used the rocky rubble for constructing stonework fencing around property boundaries. More recently, people often have allowed the rubble to accumulate along the bases of metal fencing. Without heavy machinery to remove the trees from a roadway, then people may have felled some trees, burned them, or worked around them. Additionally, people often cut the trees or at least the outreaching branches along the edges of a travel route in order to clear a wider space and to prevent encroachment by the surrounding vegetation. The results of these activities typically will decay after a few decades. In the places where I see these signs today, I know that the original activity must have occurred not too long ago. Sometimes the remains of tree cutting can reveal the lines of older roads, paths, or trails that otherwise might not be obvious. If I can adjust my angle and scale of viewing, then I may be able to detect the larger patterns. After I can notice these possible patterns at a large scale, then I can move closer to search for other possible traces of an older route that has become somewhat eroded or overgrown. A similar approach might apply not only with tree cuttings, but rather with various indicators of older or faded lines of overland travel routes. For instance, people sometimes created stacked stone features to mark the tracks or trails where they had passed. Without these markers, the route might be difficult or impossible to retrace especially if people use the track or trail only rarely and without formalized construction. These kinds of markers tend to occupy the key points in a track or trail, such as the places of choosing or changing a direction, places of gathering water or other resources, places of resting, or places of admiring a view of the surroundings. Nearly all overland travel routes could create or accelerate conditions of erosion. The precise outcome depends on the geological composition of the ground, the degree of slope, the amount of traffic, and the rainfall patterns. Even with an informal track or trail that was used only a few times, the exposure of the surface could be enough to contribute to significant erosion, wearing downward into the ground and thereby creating the effect of a formalized trail or path. 
When eroded lines pass through areas with tree roots, then the root systems potentially could decrease the amount of erosion. However, some complications are involved in the balance of multiple factors, such as the density and strength of the individual tree roots, the angle of the erosional cutting, and the impact of traffic onto any exposed tree roots. In extreme cases, such as along a steep slope, an erosional line could uproot the surrounding trees and thereby trigger a landslide. For many travel routes that cross through steep slopes, people have created additive features to enhance the stability of the route itself and of the surrounding land surface. These additive enhancements could include gravel or other surface treatment, often detectable in layers that reflect the chronological order of when they were created. Another popular additive feature could involve artificial steps. More extensive investments might include tunnels, bridges, or other major constructions that could substantiate a separate video episode. If people created a surface paving, a set of steps, or other additive enhancement, then the travel route can be interpreted as a route that people used either in high frequency or in a specialized context that justified the extra effort. In these cases, I usually search in the surrounding landscape and in the possible connecting destination points for clues about what made a particular travel route important for people. Some of this information could be found through historical maps and photographs, as well as through archaeological surveys, but other aspects might be understood only through experiencing the place on the ground. In my view, some of the most interesting clues in a travel route involve the deviations from the expected patterns. What was the purpose of creating a paving or set of stairs in one place, but not in another place? What was the purpose of making a route move in a curve instead of in a straight line? By looking at these unusual or anomalous cases, I can learn something different that makes me understand better about the travel routes as a whole. Sometimes a travel route is just as important as the final destination. In other words, each point along the route offers a sense of purpose in itself. In many cases, a particularly important spot can act as a central focal point or hub that can be accessed from multiple directions. These spots are accessible and viewable from most of the surrounding landforms, and therefore they can act as central landmarks. At the same time, these spots provide their own views outwards into the same surroundings. One such spot could be a place of an important natural resource such as a source of water that collects at the central basin point at the base of different hill slopes that conjoin together. Another such spot could be a culturally important site, for example at a hilltop that overlooks the surrounding terrain and accommodates travel routes from different sides. Often a culturally important site can involve at least some degree of additive enhancements or investment in formalizing the access routes. Travel routes are parts of the landscapes that we all inhabit, in whatever way that you may conceptualize about these tracks, trails, paths, and roads. These travel routes have shaped how people have interacted with their landscapes, within their individual lifetimes, and through much longer timescales of natural and cultural history. In concluding this episode, I would like to ask your thoughts and ideas about how you would study tracks, trails, paths, and roads. What kinds of research questions are interesting for you, and how would you go about addressing them? If you have not already subscribed to this YouTube channel, then please consider to do so. Share with your friends and explore more online videos with the Archaeology Studio.